Hey everybody, it's TR. I'm back with another RV how-to, and this week it's quite a serious RV how-to, as you can see from the cover slide, and it's about RV fire safety. Well, first I'm going to start by saying, no, this is not my rig. It was not the continuation of the month from hell, if you follow my channel. But it is something that's very serious, and it's also been on my list of videos to make for over a year now. And yesterday morning was motivation enough to get me off the dime and get this done. So please pay attention. It's very important. To start with, I want to say you, your vehicle, your situation, your environment, is going to be totally unique to you. The information I'm presenting here today are general rules of safety that apply to nearly every situation. However, your situation might be different. I thought twice about making this video because of the sensitive nature of what we're talking about today, but I thought, okay, if I disclaimer it, put you on the hook to be responsible for your own safety, hopefully I'll protect myself from some kind of weird ass lawsuit that might come out of it. I will be posting the script for this video as well as a checklist on my website for you to use as a starting point to develop your own safety plan. It is not intended to be all-inclusive. I'm no expert. I'll probably miss things and if I've missed serious things there's two things I will do. First I'm going to update the checklist on my website and if they're significant enough, I will make a new video and include your comments and suggestions that you've made below that enhance the value of this video. So I encourage you to make your comments or suggestions in the comment area below. Yesterday morning, I was sitting here around 5 a.m., having a cup of coffee, catching up on the morning news, and all hell broke loose outside. There were, what, what brought my attention to this is that there were red and blue lights flashing in my window and so, of course, I jumped up to go check and see what was going on. And when I looked out the RV, I could see flames shooting up over the top of what we affectionately call in the park here, the hill. Now, these flames are shooting 20, 30 feet in the air at this point. And I'd heard sirens, but, you know, you, you pretty much don't pay attention to sirens anymore. At least I don't. Where I could see the flames over the hill, I knew it was dang close. And so I grabbed my camera and I ran over to see what was going on and unfortunately I discovered this. What I discovered is every RVer's biggest nightmare. Now that I think about this, this is important not just to those of us with class A, B or C type RVs, but those of you that live in buses, vans, converted box trucks, any of that stuff and I watch a lot of videos about that community, or those communities, I should say, and I see some safety things going on that just make me cringe. So I had resolved myself to prepare a video to help you be prepared for what can be a very devastating event, and that's a major fire in your coach, in your RV. So today I'm gonna to be talking about fire safety, and it really, well, maybe not just specifically fire safety, but I'm just going to be talking about safety in general for those of us that are vehicle dwellers. So a little bit about the dramatic fire first. It's been chilly here in Tucson overnight, down in the 40s. I mean, you know, okay, so it's relatively chilly, you know, it's chilly for Tucson. This morning it was 41 degrees. I have to glance at my weather station before I stepped out the door, mostly because I needed, you know, I wanted to know if I needed a jacket but it was a little chilly. By the time I got over to where this fire was taking place, uh, it had been a few minutes. The fire department was already here. And of course, I'm thinking, it's chilly overnight. This is an electric heater gone wrong. Somebody has had an electric heater that set the couch on fire or something like that. This fire was in a 2006 Winnebago Tour, and it had the Norcold 1200 fridge, the exact same fridge I used to have in my RV. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. First off, I want to say I'm just heartbroken about this couple's loss. These people are full-timers. They've been full-timing for three years. They do have a house in New Mexico, but they had been living in their RV full-time for three years. As I'd mentioned in past videos, us full-timers were super protective of our rigs because pretty much our entire lives are sitting on these six wheels. 
uh, maybe I'm a little paranoid, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, fire is a huge threat and you need to be prepared for it if it breaks out in your RV. So I'm hoping that this checklist and my tips will help you get prepared. But the RV community is very strong, very giving, very caring community. And even while the fire was still burning, people were bringing the occupants of the coach clothes and shoes and asking them what they could do to help and those sorts of things. So this couple's going to be fine. I spoke to them this morning. I wanted to give them some time to kind of settle in. Both of them are very strongly traumatized by this event and you can totally understand why. The wife of the couple told me the story and so I'm going to share it with you. She was laying there in bed. This is about 4.45 in the morning and she could hear something that she thought sounded like water running. And so she didn't want to have a big flood or something going on. She got up to go check and see what the problem was. I want to note their smoke detector had not alarmed. Okay, there was no indication that there was a fire at this point until she stepped outside of her coach, looked up and saw a huge fireball coming up out of the side and the roof of the coach in the area where the fridge is. She said she screamed at the top of her lungs and to wake up the neighbors because we're in an RV park and they tend to be, you know, there tend to be tight spaces, you know, there's not a huge amount of space between. And so she really was concerned about the neighbor's safety. She went back inside the coach, got her husband, the dogs, a laptop and, their, and a telephone, a cell phone, and got out of the coach, called 911, and of course then the fire department was on their way. Well, when she screamed, she'd woke up the neighbors, and I was speaking to one of the neighbors this morning who was standing out by this burned out RV, and he told me that they had got the fire out. We had the fridge out. The fridge fire out. Yeah, but for, you could see for a short time. For oh, okay. A few but it was up in the ceiling. You could see the ceiling smolder. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. And it's like, oh, shit. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's, what do you do? You can't get in there. Yeah. We, we had those little canister type fire extinguishers. Mm -hmm. We used four of them. Wow. And it did get the, that and the water hose got the fridge out. They couldn't get into the ceiling to get the fire out. They got the flames out in the fridge, but at that point it was too late. It had spread to the RV. Luckily there's a fire station in just a couple minutes from here. Well, probably four or five miles from here. And they were here in pretty short order. They got the fire knocked down and we're protecting a fifth wheel trailer that was parked on the right side and a travel trailer on the left side and trying to get the fire out in this RV uh, all at the same time. When I spoke to the couple this morning, uh, it was clear that this fire had started in the fridge area. Again, thank goodness nobody was injured, but their RV is clearly a total loss. I have a little experience with a similar situation that I'm going to talk about in a minute related to these Norcold 1200 type fridges or just Norcold RV fridges. I mean, I got a script here so I don't mess up. So in one of my very first RV how-to videos on replacing your RV's fridge with an all-electric residential model, I showed you at some point in Rusty's life, Rusty's my RV, that it had nearly caught on fire because of the fridge. On the old Norcold 1200 I had installed, there was a recall done many years ago to install a safety device to shut down the fridge in the event that the boiler overheated. A quick side trip if I may. Most RV fridges, what I'm going to call dual fuel fridges, use an absorption type cooling system. Absorption cooling was invented by a French scientist, Ferdinand Caro, in 1858. In the original design, it used water and sulfuric acid. My old fridge was a hydrogen ammonia water combination, but they basically work on the same concept. When the refrigerant mix boils, this ammonia hydrogen water mixture that's in these refrigerators boils, it carries heat away with it, causing the cooling to happen. The absorption refrigerator, through some mechanism, and they vary, change the gas back into a liquid, but the key to that is it uses a method that uses only heat. There are no moving parts in one of these absorption cooling units. This makes them fairly reliable and it meets the needs of a quiet operation. In other words, you don't have a compressor sitting there humming along like you do on a residential fridge. 
uh, making noise. The heat source for the RV fridge varies, okay? So you need to check your owner's manual for specifics. But I'm gonna look at the most common, and those are the dual fuels, okay? As they're called, dual fuels. Or typically, they use propane or 110 electric to, to boil this refrigerant gas, if you will, this refrigerant solution. I'll also note that in most of these fridges, 12 volts DC is required for the control circuits, in other words, the thermostats and those sorts of things, and that's usually provided by your RV's house batteries. The reason they use propane is because RVs have you know, unreliable electric, okay? That's the main reason why they have dual fuel, is that your electric service is going to be unreliable. You're not always going to be sitting in an RV park plugged in, okay? You've got to have some way to keep that fridge and its contents cold as you're going down the road or if you're out there in a campground where there are not electric services. This is really common. And this type of fridge is probably in 99% of most RVs. So in the case of my old Norcold, the problem was is it would freeze up. And so when it would freeze up, the, the refrigerant solution would freeze in the coils and so there was less of this refrigerant circulating through the system. The boiler kept detecting that the fridge wasn't cooling, so it'd just keep running. It'd get hotter and hotter and hotter and start a fire, as we can see. The safety kit, as I mentioned earlier, was put on to detect when that boiler was overheating and to shut it off and therefore prevent a fire. And I know that the safety kit on my particular fridge had tripped out several times because I had to reset it over the years before I replaced it in 2016 with a total all-electric fridge, like you saw me do in the video that I posted. Gosh, this has been a couple years ago. It was one of my very, well, in fact, I think it was my very first RV how-to video. I will say that I don't recall the exact temperature that the boiler would, or that the system would shut the boiler off. You know, it was probably a couple, three or 400 degrees or something like that. I don't know that for sure, but I just know that there was a thermal couple installed on the fridge. There was a relay control system so it would shut off the power and turn off the burner to the fridge in the event that the boiler got too hot. When I spoke to the couple who owned this coach this morning, the, the, the gentleman told me that the safety recall kit had been installed on this fridge. I don't know this to be a fact, but I'm pretty sure that my actual safety recall widget that had been installed on my fridge had failed at some point and wasn't working correctly. Um, because what drove me to replace my fridge was it overheated. There was you know, some kind of a flaw in the cooling coils and all the coolant leaked out. Well, hydrogen, you may or may not know, is extremely explosive, as is propane. So you know, if you puncture one of those, you can have a pretty serious fire pretty fast. I read online that fridge fires are the number two cause of RV fires right behind electrical problems. Now, I'm not trying to cause too much alarm here because fires are at a, you know, they don't occur all the time, okay? But they do occur and they will occur when you're least expecting them. Some of the other major causes of RV fires, engine and transmission problems, uh, not keeping them maintained properly can cause issues. I, in fact, it was two summers ago I was coming out of Colorado on Monarch Pass, and there's a poor RV off the side of the road there that obviously had caught on fire. Um, and it's not that uncommon for engines or transmissions to overheat, particularly when you're climbing a very serious grade or something like that. And if you've got a lot of grease or a lot of accumulated, you know, call it uh, FOD, foreign objects and debris, um, on your transmission or engine, that stuff can catch on fire and it doesn't take long to cause a major problem. I was also part to a, next to a guy, was, this was probably three years ago now, who was driving a brand new RV and had a brand new tow car. And he related to me that one of the brakes stuck on his toad and set his car on fire, which before he could notice it, had caught the back of his RV on fire as they're driving down the road. Friction can cause fire. Seized bearings can cause fire. Descending a steep grade and riding your brakes, using your brakes improperly or descending that grade improperly can cause a fire. There's all kinds of things that can cause a fire in one of these rigs. And so, again, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but what I'm trying to do is bring your attention to the fact that fire is a real possibility and you need to be prepared for it. 
the number one cause of RV fires are electrical problems. Remember that as you roll down the road, things are rocking and rolling and shaking and moving around. And most RV, well, all RV manufacturers know this, and so they're going to secure these wires to keep them from moving and rubbing on stuff, okay? And wearing through and causing a short. I mean, just a while ago, just a month and a half or so ago, I had a hydraulic hose that was rubbing on a frame member, so I was rolling down the road, fail. I have a video on that. You can check it out up here. Rodents, on the other hand, can be a real problem and they love to chew on wire. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to give you my first tip right here. If you're camping in an area where you think there might be mice, set traps proactively. When you get there, set up a couple of mice traps and check them regularly. Mice and rats are going to raise hell with your wiring. They're filthy, disgusting little beasts. Okay, They have their purpose in life, but not inside of my RV. And I've had trouble with mice before when I've stayed in boondocking locations that were infested with mice. A quick side story here. Um, I had stayed at one of my favorite places uh, in Idaho called Birch Creek Campground. This would have been in 2016. There were mice there and they were bad. Um, I had not proactively set traps. This is where I learned this lesson. And before I realized it, you know, I saw a mouse in the coach. I trapped out six mice while I was there and trapped out an additional five mice over the two weeks after I left that camping site uh, because it was just so thick and infested with mice. They actually did get in and chew some of my wiring, caused some of my stuff to quit working correctly. One of my lights quit working and so I had to, you know, figure that out. And what I found was chewed up wiring. I'll have more on mice prevention in a future episode, so stay tuned for that. But just keep in mind that you know, when you pull into a place where you're going to be boondocking, take and put a mouse trap or two, put one in the basement, maybe put one back by your back tire, and then oftentimes I'll put one under the hood of my car. And then I check them regularly to make sure that I don't have mice or rodents or something getting in there and chewing on my wiring. It's, it's a serious situation. One of the other things you got to keep in mind about those of us that live in vehicles, nomads, RV dwellers, car dwellers, box trucks, vans, these vehicles are small, and sometimes there may be only one way out. And because they are small, things happen very fast. Fire can quickly block your access to get out the door. And I was speaking to a, a gal that's parked over here near me uh, yesterday after the fire. She says, well, I would just kick a window out. Well, let me tell you, you may not be able to kick a window out. If you've been overcome by smoke, maybe you have poor health or something like that, you need to have a plan ready to go in case there's a fire. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. The fact of the matter was is when I was speaking to the neighbors whose RV also was damaged, it did not catch fire, but it suffered some severe damage to the outside from this fire next door. I was talking to him. They had the fire out. I mentioned this earlier, but they had the fire out but within four minutes of them thinking they had the fire out, it was back through this roof of this RV and completely and totally out of control. There was nothing they could do about it. The take home message from all this doom and gloom talk, fire is a real danger to vehicle dwellers. And I use that term broadly because this applies to bus dwellers, van dwellers, box trucks. I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again so everybody gets the message. This can apply to anybody who lives in their vehicle. And so I'm hoping that you'll find this list useful. So let's talk about it. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about that is a must have, you must have these, are life safety detectors. Are smoke, propane, and carbon monoxide detectors, period. Each can and will save your life. And it's important also to remember to change the batteries. It's generally accepted that a good idea is to change your smoke, fire detectors, whatever they may be, at the same time, we change our clocks for daylight savings. Another thing to do, check them regularly. Walk over, hit the button, make sure they alarm, okay? Do this regularly. When you're thinking about it, glance up at it. Make sure the little red light's flashing on them so you know they're still working, okay? These things are important and you need to have them. As I mentioned earlier, not only are smoke detectors lifesavers, but in an RV, propane detectors are an absolute must-have. If you don't have one, you can get them. We'll talk more about that in a bit. 
the thing about propane detectors to keep in mind is, is that propane is heavier than air, so propane will sink, it will accumulate on the floor. It's a must that you install the propane detector low, as low as you can possibly get it, so that it has the most chance to detect that propane and alert you that there is propane present. Not only can propane suffocate you, but it can, well, obviously it's also explosive. In my particular RV, I have a built-in propane detector that I leave turned on any time. Well, I just leave it turned on all the time. It's hardwired to the, to the house batteries, if you will. It's 12 volts, it's housewired to the house batteries. It uses very little electricity, I don't even think about it. But, and it does work. Um, I was cleaning a camera one day with some canned air, it was light canned air, and it had butane as a propellant in the can. And I set the detector off because that butane had got to the detector that was sitting down below me and set it off. So I knew it worked, but it has a test button on it as well. And I test it about once a month, like I do my smoke detectors. Another thing to think of is if you have a coach like mine, where your sleeping quarters are separate from your living quarters, you should have two smoke and fire detectors, period. Okay? You need to have one in the bedroom and you need to have one in your living room. There are combination units on the market that have smoke, carbon monoxide, because typically you want the smoke detectors high. You know, you want the smoke detectors up high in the roof because smoke and heat rise. And as I mentioned earlier, propane is heavier than air, so it will sink. And so typically you don't find them com as a combination, but they're inexpensive. You can get them at a home improvement store and they're well worth the 12, 15, 20, 25 dollars you might invest in one to save your life. So go do it right now. Don't put it off any longer. This is really important. Have an escape plan and practice it. Okay? Know how you're going to get out of your RV or bus or van if it's on fire and the door is blocked. Commercial RVs, any commercially built RV, is required to have egress windows. What that means is that there should be windows that, are, that have levers that operate so you can push them out and escape from a burning area. I will say, I've seen a lot of buses and vans built that have no egress in them at all. And I just, it just, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, you're playing with your life. If you don't have a clear escape plan that you have worked through, you've practiced, it's in your head, you know how you're gonna get out in the case of a fire you're asking for trouble. As I mentioned earlier, I was speaking to a, a lady that lives in a fifth wheel just over here the other side of me. She says, well, I would just kick a window out. You may not be able to kick a window out. You may be incapacitated from smoke or you might be weakened, okay? And these windows are built to not break. They're built tough. They're usually built out of tempered glass. They're hard to kick out. The construction of the frame itself may be aluminum. They may be hard to kick out. You may not have the leg strength to kick a window out. Basically, the kicking a window thing out is probably not a really effective strategy, okay? These windows are built to stay in. They're not built to be kicked out easily, especially in vans, especially in buses where you're reusing the windows that were in the bus or you're taking and converting a van that maybe had windows in it. That's probably not an effective strategy. There are a number of mechanisms and methods and devices that you can buy that would help you break out a tempered glass window in the event of an emergency. And if that is your situation, if you don't have egress windows, I highly recommend that you go investigate those right now. Remember the P's, okay? I remember I had a boss that used to tell this to me all the time and this is so important. Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Now I'm gonna modify that to the I'm going to call it PAPID, P-P-P-A-E-D, prior planning prevents an early death. The second thing that is really important, and I'm bad at this, I've gotten better over the years, know where you're parked, okay? It's so easy to navigate to Walmart or someplace with your Garmin or your GPS or your cell phone and you get there and you get parked. And you don't even know what your physical address is. If you had to call the fire department, if you don't know where you are, how the hell is the fire department gonna come and help you? Know where you are, okay? Absolutely important. Know where you are, know your physical address. If you're getting old and you can't remember things sometimes like I do, write it down, put it somewhere safe. Keep the brochure you get if you're in an RP park that has the address on it. 
put it somewhere where you can find it in the event of an emergency. Be it a Walmart, a truck stop, a rest area, boondocking, whatever it is, know where you are. It could save your life. Maintenance cannot be overemphasized. You must keep your RV well maintained. Inspect it regularly. And if you don't feel comfortable doing this yourself, any reputable RV repair shop can do this for you for a very inexpensive price. It's cheap peace of mind. Now, I'm pretty handy and I feel pretty comfortable doing this. So I go around, I have a checklist that I do once a month, particularly when I'm parked like I am here for the winter. Right around the first Saturday of the month and I'll start the RV and I'll let it warm up. I'll go around and it pumps up the airbags. I let the jacks down and up. I bring the slides in and out to make sure everything's kind of being maintained. And then I go around and I open every access door to every appliance and I look for bugs, critters, chewed wiring, wiring that looks like it might have been hot. I look for loose connections. I'll take and anything that has a plug or anything like that, I'll, I'll make sure that they're all plugged in tight. Again, do this monthly, do this regularly, it can save your life. You have to keep your RV appliances clean and maintained at all times. That's the biggest, especially the appliances that use propane. If you spot anything out of the ordinary, stop right then and get it fixed, okay? Don't keep rolling down the road. You could cause yourself a serious problem. If you're not comfortable addressing these issues, call a professional. Also, it's absolutely important that you maintain your propane system. Propane tanks, propane lines, all the connections. Every other year, I take my RV to an RV repair shop and I have the propane system inspected by a licensed, certified technician that is used to working with those systems. Yes, it's easy enough to check it yourself and I do regularly with a little bit of soap in a spray bottle and I'll go around and I check all the connections for where, where every piece of propane pipe comes together, any joint, I can check all of those that I can get to. The one that attaches to my range that's right here, you don't see it because it's off camera. I can't get to that, I can't see it. And so that one always kind of makes me a little nervous. Maintain your propane tanks. If they're dented, get rid of them. Get a new one, they're not that expensive. If they're rusty, clean the rust off and repaint it. Don't let them rust through. Remember, you've got a bomb inside of your vehicle or attached to your vehicle that you're rolling down the road with. You don't want that thing going off because not only could it kill you, it could kill people around you. And that's not a situation you want to get into. Right. For maximum safety, you should turn your propane tank off whenever you're moving the vehicle. But who does this? I don't. Do you? We want the convenience of having that propane on so that our fridge and our groceries and our food stays cold. I don't do it. I don't turn it off unless it's required. So I've, had, I've taken a ferry ride at one point across Lake Michigan where I had to turn off the propane. In fact, they came around, the, you know, the, one of the crew of the ferry came around and inspected and made sure the propane was turned off. Uh, also certain tunnels. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the tunnel that's out there in Virginia Beach that takes you underneath the Chesapeake Bay. There's signs and flashing lights and everything everywhere that says no propane tanks, no propane tanks, turn your propane off, turn your propane off. Okay. So in that case, yes, they provided you a pull out where you could pull off, as I did, I got out and turned my propane off, and then of course I went through the tunnel. Always a must whenever you're buying propane or having your propane tank fueled, if it's fixed like mine to the underside of the chassis, to turn it off, turn the engine off. You don't want to have any errant sparks or other ignition sources around when you're filling that tank because propane is very explosive. Oh, and before I forget, never leave an open flame burning when you leave your RV. I don't care what it is, a candle, one of those little buddy heaters. I see a lot of people with bus, that live in buses and in vans and in box truck conversions that have these little buddy heaters, and they're great. But there's two problems with them. First off, you have an open flame. You do not want to leave it unattended. The second thing is, those things generate a lot of carbon monoxide, which can also kill you, which is the reason why you need a carbon monoxide sensor or detector somewhere, and preferably more than one in your RV, so you know if you're getting asphyxiated. 
The same thing goes, I mean, this is common sense. You would think it's common sense, but people do this all the time. Leave an electric heater running when you leave the RV because it's cold. You might come back to a smoldering pile of ashes if you do, okay? So safety, safety, safety. I cannot overemphasize it. Don't leave an open flame burning. No buddy heaters, no candles, nothing. Make sure your RV is safe before you leave it for the day. And that brings me to the next one. Use open flames with care, okay? I have a propane stove, okay, a propane cooktop, whatever you want to call it. Make sure the area around it's clean. Make sure it, the top of it's clean. Now, I'm not too good at this sometimes. I need to, actually, I'm thinking I need to clean it now. Uh, but grease and that kind of stuff can cause a hell of a fire. And again, keep in mind, these RVs are small. They're built out of materials that are highly flammable, and it takes no time, no time for the fire to spread. Another side story, if, you, if I may. It was about six years ago, I was out in Ohio, uh, Sandusky, Ohio, uh, what, Cedar Point is the name, the big, you know, it's, there's a big uh, amusement park out there called Cedar Point that we were visiting. Uh, you know, I don't remember the exact days or anything like this, this is a long time ago. But I do remember there was a fire at an RV in that park, and what had happened was, is the guy had got his propane grill out, he had it right up against the side of his RV, they were cooking on it, he stepped away for a few minutes to do something. When he came back, the whole side of his RV was on fire. I didn't see this fire, but I saw what happened, and it wasn't pretty. It's not something you want to do. So campfires, grills, those sorts of things, keep them away from your vehicle, period. One of the other things, and you can call me paranoid if you want, I don't care, but whenever I'm camped boondocking, I'm not in an improved campsite. And even if there is a fire ring, I'm super careful about this is if I'm grilling or I've got a fire going, I have a five pound fire extinguisher I keep in the basement and I will actually take it out, put it by the back tire of the RV just so it's handy so if that fire gets away from me, I can knock it down because I don't want to be that guy, you know the guy, the guy that burns down a million acres. Let's talk about batteries and I'm talking about all kinds of batteries, not just the lead acid batteries that you find in your RV or your rig, your car, your truck, whatever the case may be. Those batteries must be vented to the outside because they can produce explosive, dangerous gas. That gas is hydrogen sulfide, and it's particularly nasty. Here's the thing about hydrogen sulfide. It's produced in moderate quantities anytime you're using that battery, charging, discharging, I don't care what it is. There's always a little bit of hydrogen sulfide that's going to be coming off that battery. You're probably used to and probably smelled hydrogen sulfide, particularly if you have an RV, because if you have an RV holding tank, particularly your black tank, when it gets anaerobic, in other words, there's not enough oxygen in the tank, they can produce hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is a double killer. If it doesn't kill you by suffocating you, it will kill you when it explodes. Now, an RV black tank is not going to produce enough hydrogen sulfide to make it more than just miserable to be inside your coach. It's that rotten egg nasty smell you get when you drive by the sewer processing plant or your RV tank hasn't been ducked for a while and it's starting to stink and you can smell it. Your holding tank is not going to produce enough to cause an explosion. On the other hand, your 12 volt lead acid batteries absolutely can produce enough hydrogen sulfide gas to kill you either by suffocating you or causing a very serious explosion and you don't want to be around a battery explosion. I have. I've seen a battery explosion. In fact, I was in a battery explosion once when we had gone out to do maintenance on an emergency generator for a server room that I had. And when we hit the start button, that battery let go and it threw acid and everything everywhere. You know, there were three people in the room with me. We ran for the emergency shower and basically, you know, we got ourselves cleaned up, but it's not something to be, to be around. It is something that's extremely scary, and it does happen more than you would recognize. For more information about what goes on with your uh, RV's holding tank, I'm going to refer you to this video, another one of the first RV how-to videos I did on maintaining your black tank using something I call the BioGeo method. But again, I digress. We'll get back on top. Lithium batteries present a particularly tricky problem. Famous fire causers are lithium batteries. Everything from airplanes to scooters have been brought down in flames because of lithium batteries. I'm not going to talk about lithium batteries that may be installed in your coach. If you're sophisticated enough to have put lithium batteries in your RV, I hope 
you're also sophisticated enough to know that you have to treat those batteries with extreme care, that you charge them correctly, that you store them correctly. I'm not going to get into that. If you want information about how to do lithium batteries for your RV correctly, there is a delta of information available on the web. Go look it up. It's important if you have lithium batteries. What I am going to talk about has happened to me, and that's all those extra lithium batteries you have laying around for your GoPro. Let's see, do I have one here for my camera? Oh, here's one. Here's a lithium battery for my GoPro. I have these lithium batteries for my DSLR and all those sorts of things. They could be dangerous as well, and here's an example. I had a lithium camera battery sitting on my desk here. It was one off of one of my old DSLRs. And I was working on something, I don't know, and I had this little screwdriver in my hand and I threw it on the table and I wasn't paying any attention and I was over watching TV or something, I don't know, and I could smell something plastic burning. I'm thinking, man, what is that? I jumped up to find out that little metal screwdriver had welded itself to the terminals of that battery. And it was basically close to catching on fire. So that taught me a lesson right then. I don't store my spare batteries in the drawers or anything like that. I try to store any lithium type battery in an appropriate manner because they are fire causers. It is well known that they're fire causers and they need to be treated and handled with care. Enough about batteries. Finally, it is absolutely important that you have a fire extinguisher and preferably multiple fire extinguishers. As I mentioned, I have, I have two fire extinguishers inside the cab of my RV. In other words, I have one up by the front door. There's one over here underneath the sink. They're small ones. They're those little one-pounders, okay? And I have a story about those. I guess it was last year when there was that huge recall on kitty fire extinguishers. You know, they're the little, like, one-pounder, you know, home-style type fire extinguishers where kitty uh, fire extinguisher had to recall millions of those because they were defective. That triggered me to go check my extinguishers, wondering if I had one that had been recalled. Unfortunately, they hadn't, but the one up by the front door had discharged. Somehow the charge, you know, the pressure that was in there had leaked off over the years, and it was basically worthless. If I'd have had a fire and I'd gone for that fire extinguisher, I'd have been in a huge mess. I also keep a five pounder, as I mentioned, in the basement of the RV. Uh, just in case there's a larger fire, one of those little one-pounders isn't going to get you very far, but a five-pounder might save your life, or at least save part of your property in the event of a fire. It's a good idea to have a larger fire extinguisher if you have the space for it. Van dwellers, bus dwellers, you may not have the space, but make damn sure you have at least one BC type fire extinguisher, preferably ABC, but at a minimum a BC type fire extinguisher. Oh, one other thing before I forget talking about fire extinguishers. Keep a spare, small fire extinguisher in your towed, okay, as we affectionately call them towed, your towed car. Fire safety is nothing to take lightly. It is serious, serious business. I'd had this on my list for a year, and this unfortunate incident that happened yesterday morning has driven me to get this video out as soon as I possibly can, and perhaps help you protect yourself from fire. Make it a part of your monthly maintenance to go around and check all of the stuff that we've discussed in this video. Make sure you've got working fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, propane detectors, whatever the case may be. So I've prepared this script and I'm putting it on my website along with a checklist again to help you get started preparing your own escape plans, safety plans, maintenance plans, and so on and so forth that are specific to your life situation. I want to encourage a discussion on this. If you think there's things that I've missed, put it in the comments below. Put your tips and tricks, things that you do to stay fire safe, in the comments below and I'll add those in and make another video and share your ideas along with mine with our community, this very strong, powerful, caring, giving RV community, as the comments warn. I can't overemphasize this enough. The plan that I'm preparing and sharing with you is a starting point. Your individual situation may be different. It is up to you to take the information I'm sharing with you and modify it to your own personal situation. 
be responsible for your own actions. And I'm sure there's plenty I've missed. So again, I encourage your comments, discussion below. I will update the checklist and the video as warranted. Now well, that's it. An unfortunate situation. It just breaks my heart to speak to these people and understand their loss. I feel their pain. I live in my RV full time. My whole life is right here and it would be devastating to have a fire. Be prepared. Take pictures of your stuff, okay? In other words, go around with your cell phone or whatever it is. Take pictures of your stuff. It's going to get you so much further down the road if you do have a fire when you have evidence that you had a $2,500 video camera or whatever the case may be. You're not going to be sitting there picking nits with your insurance company and say, yeah, I had a Nikon D850 or whatever the case may be and, and here it is and so on and so forth. So that's a great last parting thought. Just take pictures of your stuff and keep them safe. Okay? Keep it safe. That's it. Thanks for watching. Please be safe. Please be aware that fire is a killer. It can happen in a second. And again, because we're, we live in these small confined spaces, it can happen fast and it can be deadly. Be prepared. Thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do all those fun social things. But with that, it's time to go. Thanks again for watching. I do appreciate it. Until we get together again safely, peace.